It's a magical, mystical time. It's anecdotal adventures. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Anecdotal Adventures Reads Worm. Uh, I'm your host, Ashley, and this is my co-host. I'm Cassidy. Uh, and today we will go over Arc 8 Extermination, which, oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, oh boy. And just to recap, we've changed our format. We've read before we started the podcast this time. So we're just going to kind of jump right into it. <laughs> With our recap, uh, starting at 8.1. Uh which is really just like the first couple chapters are the lead in to the Endbringer attack. Uh, <laughs> you have a look of wild panic on your face. Just, yeah, I'm glancing through it because despite the fact that I read it recently, I'm like, my brain isn't super collected. I, th- I think that's been a like continuing theme on this. Hey. My brain is just the, okay, yeah. <laughs> the lead up to 8.1, which, or the lead up. Lead up to 8.1, <laughs> that, that was our seven. I uh, hate to let you know. <laughs> I'm just going to go die in the hole now. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. Uh, but all the heroes and the villains that are going to participate in the oncoming fight are gathering in one place, and Taylor sort of just clocks everyone that's there. Uh, Empire 88 showed up. Uh, the travelers on the villain side, uh, the undersiders are there. Uh, but the other two villain groups that we've met largely uh, in Worm, Coil's men aren't there, which she does snidely comment on. <laughs> and I honestly, though, they were probably helping. <laughs> They might have not shown up. Like, what would they have done here, Taylor? Yeah, they're probably doing search and rescue in the city. They are probably helping. This is a capes meeting. None of none of Quill's bones are capes, except for himself. And you think he'd show up anywhere? I feel like that's the entire point. Like that that has been established. That's the entire point of Quill's crew. Is so. But like, what? What? It's okay, girl. We get it. We wanted them to be there too. And then, oh my god, I didn't write the group's down name, but it's, it's the other one. <laughs> it has the girl that can control architect, architecture, labyrinth, on the team. <sighs> it's gonna bug me. Control F. But I, but I can't remember. It won't mention labyrinth, but, because they're not there. The other group that's not there. Yeah, control F coil, because it'll be right next to his name. <laughs> Okay. Control F. They mentioned both. I I hate that I don't remember it. Real professionalism here. Uh, but I didn't write it down in my notes. Fault lines crew. Yes, fault lines crew. Okay. There uh, we go. Also not there. Uh, also not participating in this. Did you? Wait, did you just make a comment on professionalism? We have none. Yeah, we've literally said punch Nazis in this in this show before. We don't have. <laughs> we have no professionalism, but I mean, <laughs> it never hurts to remind everyone what they're signing up for by listening to us. <laughs> Just set our baselines. <laughs> let them I literally, know. I li- literally started the show with, "Oh, I'm scatterbrained. I would like to go crawl in a hole and die." So yeah. that's what you signed up all for. Right. But she notes all the villain groups, and then she turns and she notes all the heroes. Uh, which is all the heroes, because... Oh my god, uh, she was notes, standing uh, The local early. hero teams were present in force. I wasn't surprised. Skipping this fight as a hero, let alone a team of heroes, would be unforgivable to the public. This is sort of a, what heroes are here for? They can't um, sign up for this. This is why heroes are around. <laughs> oh my god, but she was fangirling so hard. Oh yeah, over... Alan, Alexandria, legend. She was like, oh my gosh. And then everything went wrong. <laughs> well, that's kind of the story of Worm, isn't it? And then everything went wrong. <laughs> it went wrong. That's 
that's kind of uh, how worm works. Uh, but Lisa leads her there. Um, and the, the underside boys uh, ignore Taylor. They look at her and then they look away. <laughs> Big ol' middle fingers. Um. Uh, yeah, and Taylor uh, just kind of is thrown back into the mindset that she was at school. Uh, as she, I wrote down a bunch of quotes so I can read them out from the text. Ooh, text evidence. English class. <laughs> Let's go. But I was worried about it stupidly. I felt like I was back in school, the only kid left when everyone else had found their groups, and a hit to my confidence was not what I needed on a day like this. I looked for a place to sit and settled for a chair in the overall vicinity of the undersiders and the travelers. And I'm, you made the correct moral choice in leaving the undersiders, Taylor. Yeah, we're cheering for you. Yeah. In that one kind of situation, you know, overall, morally, you know, yeah, you've kind of, but you've slid. You you've done some some sliding. At but least you've drawn a why line. Why we can root for you? It's <laughs> because you got the hard line. You got the mission. But I do feel really bad for her here, because she worked really hard to to get these friends and like gave up pretty much everything for them because she was planning to like turn them over and start a new life as a ward later in this chapter in this arc we see how she just does not do that at all for multiple reasons which we'll get to but <laughs> mostly because her faith in the wards has been destroyed inexorably oh, but <laughs> my heart <laughs> but we will get to it because this is chapter one and that's like chapter seven uh, but the chapter ends on taylor sort of being excited as legend starts a speech and she's like oh a speech from legend this is gonna be great and the chapter ends on this quote but you should know your chances going in given the statistics from our previous encounters with this beast a good day still means that one in four of the people in this room will probably be dead before the day is done that's sort of the, the closing mark of this chapter. And then uh, chapter two is sort of all of legend. It's basically legend's speech for the most part. And we get a lot of background information on Leviathan, on the Endbringer. I want to comment on legend's speech. I really did appreciate the whole, he was like specifically pulling this from like the second paragraph. I have seen too many good heroes, he paused for a, se a fraction of a second, and villains too, die because they let their guard down. Good heroes and villains die. But, he was like, I see you, also, you're here, thing. Later, I think the pause is also very important. <laughs> yeah, well, and he's probably not used to because addressing he's, a villain. He's probably like, heroes surveying the room, and villains. <laughs> heroes and you are and not you a guys, hero. I, you guys too, I guess. <laughs> but at least they got a you guys too. A lot of them don't deserve that. No, considering like half of the villains in this room are Empire 88. <laughs> don't deserve that at all. Uh, but we got a lot of information about the Endbringers and some more world building here that I think to review. So uh, I'm pretty much all my quotes are just Legends of Speech because... Uh, Taylor may have been like, oh no, his speech is going to be, what a downer. I thought it was really great. <laughs> He's a pretty great, I felt motivated. I felt like I learned I a lot. I too. I did, I felt motivated, like, I would have been like, all right, let's, let's, do, so, let's go do this. I, I mean, somberly, but. No, I would have been, been, this been pumping me up. I would have been like, oh, he did what now? And we also get some ago? information on the other two as well. We think of Leviathan as the middle child. He was the second of the three to arrive. He is not the physical powerhouse behemoth is, nor the cunning manipulator that the Smurg so often proves to be. That said, I would advise you to think of him as having many of the strengths of both siblings at once. You've seen the videos on television and the internet. You know what he is physically capable of. 
I want to be clear that despite the image he might convey, he is not stupid and he can display a level of cunning and tactics that can and will catch you off guard. Foreshadowing. Uh, <laughs> I want you to tell you what you may not know from the videos. He feels pain, he does bleed, but few attacks seem to penetrate deep enough to pass the surface to seriously harm him. He is like the other two Endbringers in this respect. What sets him apart is his focus on water. You're likely aware of his after image, his water echo. This is no mere splash of water. At the speed Leviathan can move, surface tension and compressibility make water harder than concrete. He also has a crude hydrokinesis, the ability to manipulate water, and there will be water on the battlefield. We believe that this is what lets him move as fast as he does when he is swimming, faster than he normally, than he is normally, far faster than any speedster we have on record. Uh, and we get a couple more tidbits of information about Leviathan and his powers and also the things he's done in the past and how uh, the, the protector has dealt with Endbringers in the past, specifically with the Viathan, uh, and how they divide things into hard, target, hard targets, which they would protect to the end of things, and soft targets, which, if attacked, are probably goners. <laughs> Raccoon Bay is a, a soft target because it's on the water near an aquifer. <laughs> so... And from what has been established, not actually all that populous. It's not a huge city. More touristy. So they're probably like, we could afford to lose. <laughs> they don't want to, and they do fight very hard, but he does present pretty accurately to what the Protectorate plans here. Uh, and we get some background onto some things about this world, uh, that like, anywhere that a Leviathan attacks, basically like, Newfoundland is gone. Gone. Like the gone. whole parts of Japan are gone. <laughs> because Leviathan, we will see this later, brings huge crashing waves of water that can just, it can and do murder people. <laughs> uh, and just take everything in their path down getting some context to the power of Endbringers. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to establish, if you live in a landlocked area and you think you know what a wave hurts like, you do not know what a wave hurts like. You really don't. Until you've gotten caught in a wave and then you were like, okay, that's what a wave hurts like because it yeah, hurts. And in one a very of his specific way. powers and the effects of his abilities is that it just makes water tension just harder. It makes it hit harder. Oh, the thought of a wave hitting you even harder than waves yeah. do hit you. These are forces of nature, uh, and there are three of them. Uh, one seems to be more monstrous, and that is the oldest, like the first one to appear, Behemoth. Leviathan is our awkward middle child, uh, and <laughs> Smurg is- don't seem very awkward. Smurg is the cunning one. I don't know what that means. That could be terrifying. Imagine a, yeah, a force of nature with a brain. Uh, nature? You're just referring to nature. Nature has a brain. We know it. We've seen it. That shit reacts. No, but a force of nature with, like, human intelligence. <laughs> Ah, you built a thing. It'd be awful if that thing were to critically melt down. But Dun -dun. we will get to it because it talks about it later in the chapter, but Leviathan is no dumb brute either, as Legend mentioned, and there was clearly, like, a deeper purpose behind this attack. And also a strategy, which surprised me <laughs> while reading. Uh, but before the chapter ends with Leviathan attacking and everyone gearing up to get ready to go, he has arrived, and uh, they have no time to wait. Everyone gets armbands that communicate with them, uh, and they can communicate in turn as well of important information. And it helps to coordinate the battlefield. They were designed by a dragon. Uh, and 
before we get to the next chapter, we have the bonus interludes. Uh, to fill you in on what the bonus interludes are, uh, Wildbo has a Patreon, and when he reached a Patreon goal, he would go back and add these bonus interludes. This one's for Lisa, though. <laughs> and it, it opens where it's not on Lisa, it's on another woman who Lisa is doing one of her schemes on. And you know it's Lisa by the end of the paragraph because of the vulpine smile, and that is Lisa's shtick. Face. <laughs> uh, and we go through it, and it gives us... It, it cuts back and forth through time, uh, jumping to Lisa getting recruited by Coyle, uh, and the present day in the battle uh, with Leviathan. I have a lot of quotes that stood out here because Lisa's power gives us a lot of interesting things. <laughs> and we, we get to know how Lisa's power works a little better as well. We now understand a little more how it works before we were in a bit of a dead zone. Uh, and Lisa was mysterious and all-knowing. But now we sort of see more concretely what it is like. Yeah. Which just seems absolutely over freaking whelming. Oh yeah, she gets if she doesn't if she lets it, her power just go on 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 and on and on forever. Could you imagine me with an ability like that? I would just let it. <laughs> it would be so fun. You would. I'd be like, uh, Ooh, but it jumps back to the Leviathan battle, uh, and pretty pretty quickly, uh, and. Lisa sort of has a quick conversation with Gru and Regent and looks over and down at Taylor uh, and kind of talks, talks her up a little bit. Uh, and it is clear that Lisa still likes Taylor and still considers her, like, would like to be her friend and regrets how things went down. There's one little sentence in there that is italicized, like when all the things are, when she uses her powers are, which I thought was interesting. Uh, it went, she'd be better at using my power than I am. Oof, oof, I didn't even notice that that was italicized. Yeah, and I don't know if that was to show thoughts, like that she's thinking, that she's just thinking that. In her or her power model. just Or her power delivered that in. Either way, it's kind of sad. <laughs> That hurts. Uh, but we also learn in this chapter that Lisa Wilborn is perhaps not Lisa's real name. Uh, it could be Sarah L Livesley? Livesey? I can't pronounce that. Yeah, we have no idea which. Uh, yeah, and we see her getting recruited by Coil, which was really more of a, <laughs> a kidnapping that went well. <laughs> I like semi consensual kidnapping. Yeah, here's how what her power did. She said, "Word choice: buy versus hire. Large amounts of money involved. Word choice: buy versus make an offer. Not really a negotiation." So, yeah. a kidnapping gone well. <laughs> Uh, and then we go cut back once more, back to the battlefield. We have another conversation with the Undersiders about how, how, what they're going to do if Lisa dies, and Brian doesn't even want to talk about it. He's like, no one's going to die. I'm just like, statistically, one of us is going to die. <laughs> so if I die, there's going to be a letter in the mail with all the bank accounts I have. Split the money among yourselves. Give some to Taylor. <laughs> and they talk, and she... Talks to Brian, and if you die, we'll take care of Aisha. And it's really nice. It's like a we're gonna go in here, and we could very easily be dead coming out of this. Uh, and Lisa knows that very hard because her uh, her power uh, gives her <laughs> those <laughs> nice statistics. Those are those, uh, those nice little numbers that lets her know, hey, you you your friends probably all gonna die. Uh, maybe get on that. Maybe do something about that. I do appreciate that um, she was going through all of this, and then of course she looked at she looked at um, Taylor and Lisa was like, "Well, 
would Taylor want me to tell her dad the truth or keep it a secret if Taylor dies? So I do appreciate that Lisa was like, well, if Taylor dies, of course I'm going to do something for Taylor. Um, but like, come on, Lisa, be ballsy enough to be like, if you die, be, do you want me to tell your dad all of this or do you want me to just leave it alone? Just leave it alone. Let's leave it alone. I apologize for my dogs. <laughs> it's okay. He's so cute. It's fine. They're cute, but they're loud. Uh, but while this is happening, uh, she kind of gives a sideways glance, makes sure that Taylor can't hear her, and then like, hush, hush, talks to Alec. I guess your secret weapon isn't going to work either. Secret weapon. Like, they, they had some stuff they weren't telling Taylor, it looks like. <laughs> Some stuff? Hmm. And we find out later why that probably makes sense, because Lisa knew the whole time, though she didn't tell anyone. She was pretty sure that she could sway Taylor. She did. She did sway Taylor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was 100%. There was just that one mistake at the end, which she's, like, hitting just, herself over. Just that one mistake. Lisa, the mastermind of our hearts. <laughs> She's, she's the mastermind. She's like an evil genius mastermind. She looked up Taylor, who's this, like, emotionally vulnerable girl, and was like, you may think you're going to betray us, but I don't think that'll be true by the end of the month. I'm glancing through the story yeah. to see if I miss and, anything. And uh, Lisa continues to watch the battle, and I'm going to share some quotes about her power of things that are interesting that she learned over the course of the battle. Uh, Dragon enters the battlefield with a suit packed with explosives. Risky. Current suit has insufficient room for arms and legs. Suit unmanned. Uh, so. Unmanned little suit there. Uh, apparently sending in Iron Man style empty, <laughs> empty robots. And then she looks at, she gets a good look at Leviathan and has to get, and continuously tries to find some information about him. I'm going to read all of it, but it's a lot. So gear up. I'm ready. Leviathan, non-standard cardiac nervous systems, irregular biology, no standard organs or weak points, no brain, heart, or center of operations for rest of his body. Irregular biology, no vulnerable organs, body divided into layers extending down to hyperdurable core body. Each layer down is slightly more than twice as durable as previous. Exterior skin is hard as aluminum alloy, but flexible, lets him move, and then it gives a bunch of percentages that she cuts off because she's like, this is unhelpful information that I don't need to know. Uh, and then she gets a little tidbit, not human, never was. Uh, no vulnerable organs, hyperdurable tissues. Simple organs exist at core of torso, where there is highest amount of surrounding tissues. Optimal thickness of layer and narrowness of body part at upper arms, just before shoulder joints and upper thighs, just below hip joints. Uh, and she sort of finds out that there's a part on his arm where that connects that is, like, sort of the weakest point. Not really a weak point, but, like, a place to attack. And before she can get that information, a wave crashes into her building. Um, we cut back away uh, to the first meeting of the Undersiders. Uh, <laughs> with featuring Lisa's thoughts on each of them. <laughs> I feel like she clocks them pretty accurately. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm just going to read her powers little blurbs about them. Orders demand, for, for, for Brian, orders, demands, statements, and condemnations, use of skull and costume, solo operator, organized, careful to divorce emotion from action and agenda, falls back on orders, rules, self-discipline in times of stress. And about Rachel, word choice two, haunted by demons, swearing, antisocial, unhappy with status quo, seeking to change things, seeking money, power, prestige, antisocial swearing, clothes, prioritizing function and comfort over style, not seeking human connections, prefers company of dogs, powers relate to dogs. Powers relating to dogs, not seeking human connections, antisocial inner demons, power side effects, disconnected standard human empathy and understanding, no longer grasps full extent of human relations, signals, signs, cues. So, uh, get how 
uh, Lisa found out about Rachel's dog psychology in the first sentence of talking to her. Uh, and then for Alex, disinterested or affected disinterest, lack of engagement, lack of pupil dilation or contradiction coinciding with eye contact, limited emotional depth, deeply repressed emotions and or depression, sociopath. Sociopath. <laughs> Did you not catch that? No, I didn't catch that part, but okay, just toss that one out there then. Just put it out there, put it out into the world. Uh, and then Lisa's interlude ends on her just getting one in to annoy Brian, using a statement she know would get on his nerves, <laughs> and the chapter ends. Uh, and Lisa's interlude was great. I already loved Lisa before this. My opinions have not changed. <laughs> I feel like you were just waiting for this interlude. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure you had talked about it before. Oh, yes. Lisa's interlude is one of my favorites. Because it contextualizes her power really neatly and shows us a little more about how thinker powers work. Uh, in conjunction with Lisa just being pretty sly and good at using her abilities to her advantage. Lisa would be a bard in D&D. <laughs> I was such a crappy bard. <laughs> All the stuff that goes into being a bard. If you're a good bard, you are an like, intelligent person. Uh, but we cut back to Taylor. Uh, I'm going to speed through because I uh, here because it's just the battle of hit by hit by hit here. Uh, and a lot happens in a short span of time. So Taylor knows she can't help in the main fight, uh, and so has devoted herself to doing first aid work and rescue work, which is smart considering her power set. So she runs around doing first aid, trying to help people. Uh, but as she was watching it, she's watching heroes and villains alike go down one after another. It's this really sense of hopelessness. Uh, I didn't write it down, but as soon as Leviathan starts attacking in when we first left her off, it's just this person down, this person down, this person down, this person deceased. And, you, and that's a constant ringer that breaks paragraphs here all the time. You, it gives you really a sense of how many people are dying or getting severely injured by Leviathan's attacks. And it's also an, an important little thing to note for later on, because those armbands will, uh, will come back in uh, for a certain point in time. Uh, and during this, uh, Taylor hears Telltale's name uh, over the thing, and she gets panicked because uh, she thinks Lisa might have died. Uh, luckily, we know later uh, she didn't didn't die. <laughs> but it was a, a scary tension. Uh, just the chaos of the battlefield, not knowing what's happened, having lost track of everyone she knows. And she's pretty close to where Leviathan actually is. She gets her first good look at him and feels, and like moments before she thinks she's going to die, pretty much. Uh, clock blocker! <laughs> oh, that kid comes in clutch. That, this, this particular ward, this one in particular, traumatized every single time he's gone out on a battlefield. We have seen him get. <laughs> and he was. I wish, I wish he had, uh, I wish there was a little bit more explanation, him being like, hey, like, he, it's invincible while it's frozen. Like, please don't blow me up. You're trying to blow it up. <laughs> but he jumps in and he freezes uh, Leviathan in place, which is very nice. Uh, as... I wrote the paragraph down because I thought it was nice. It took me a second to realize what had happened. Leviathan hung frozen mid-pounce and his emerging after image similarly stood there, frozen in time. In the midst of the after, after image was clock blocker half immersed in water. The time freezing effect of clock blocker's power lasted anywhere between 30 seconds to 10 minutes. How long had we spent here since clock blocker had given us this momentary reprieve? It was hard to judge the passage of time with the adrenaline frantic pace of the ongoing battle. Uh, so she, knows that if that like, clock blocker has frozen himself inside the after image of Leviathan and he will drown in there if he stays. So she uses her arm brand to up the priority of something and get a teleporter to her to save <laughs> his life. And the teleporter's trickster <laughs> just 
<laughs> just appeared. It's very like casual. How, how, do you, how do you know that he's still like a, if he's stuck? How do you know he still needs to breathe? Like, well, you see. Well, <laughs> there was this one time with some some bugs. <laughs> Uh, poor kid is a little traumatized now, but, uh... But, uh and Trickster, uh, says some, like, line over a dead hero's body and uses that hero's body to replace with Clockblocker to get him out of there. Uh, and then the heroes take, uh, advantage of, uh, Leviathan being frozen in time to try to set up more plans. Which, good job, heroes, but, like... Not right now, because you can't hurt him while he's frozen. That's how that yeah, works. That's one of the things we've learned first thing about <laughs> Clockbuggers' powers are the things that he freezes are invincible. It's like, I still... puts a piece of paper in the air, and the car crashes into it. The car gets destroyed, the paper's fine. I still think that kid would be OP with, like, a roll of dental floss. Like... <laughs> he just needs to carry more things on him. Yeah. <laughs> Like a grappling hook. Most people couldn't pull it off, but it would be his greatest freaking weapon. Just to be like, well, no, you're not getting away. Not everyone can be as smart and diverse in their ability set as Taylor. We're very spoiled with Harry's our main character, always thinking, always adapting, always doing new things with their ability. But if you had an ability, and this is basically going to be your whole life, you would tinker with it. Would you not? Like, I know for a fact I would tinker with it. I don't know, but it sort of depends on the breadth of your imaginative ability. Why aren't his teammates being like, hey, why don't you mess with your power a little bit? I don't bit? know, I don't know. But uh, I like, guess th- there is a lot you, going on in the woods. <laughs> if you freeze ice well, we know time, one of we know what one melt? of his teammates isn't, because uh, I don't think she'd ever say anything good ever or helpful. Shadow Stalker. We'll get it. <laughs> We'll get there. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, Arms Master ends up kind of trying a 1v1 and Endbringer, which uh, doesn't end well. No. Last episode, no. I played Devil's Advocate for Arms Master, gleefully preparing for this arc. <laughs> I can smell them, Ashley. I can smell narcissists. An arms and master. Uh, not not only like at first I thought he was just being kind of dumb when I first read this and trying to one v one an Embringer. I was like, dude, did you not listen to Legend's speech in the beginning? <laughs> you're underestimating him. Yeah. You're getting cocky and you're gonna die. <laughs> Uh, but we find out later that it was more than just stupidity. It was gross negligence and some nefarious plotting that went on that got him that one-on-one fight. But Scion arrives triumphantly. Uh, chases away Leviathan. And the city stands, very destroyed, lots of people dead. But a relative victory. The city's still there, is, is what we're, we're going for. It's not in the aquifer, which was the whole point of this. Uh, but as the fight ends, Taylor gets really injured. Rachel shows up and saves her. Uh, and a lot of dogs die. <laughs> no. It was sad. I feel so bad for but she, Rachel. Uh, lets Taylor get taken away to get medical attention after Taylor gets really hurt. And, well! <laughs> the, but, hold on, the most Rachel thing is Taylor being like, I think my back's broken, and Rachel going, oh, let's get you medical attention, and then dragging her by her outfit to go get medical attention. Oh, yeah. Instead of, like, lifting her or doing anything like that, just Grabbing her and dragging her. I think oh, that I was. I broke my back. It was a little bit of a spite move there. I'm betting. Yeah. I mean, you betray a dog's trust. They don't. You don't get that back. I don't. Rachel's been I betrayed. Mean, I honestly 
I have a feeling that Rachel probably in this, the whole Taylor drawing her moral line, I feel like Rachel probably is hurt by it, but I don't think she feels as betrayed as the other two probably feel. We'll see if that's true later, I guess. No, it changes. It changes 100%, but... Um, but... Taylor gets taken to get medical attention, and we see how they treat villains after the fight with Amber, after the truce sort of comes to an end. She just gets, like, chained, and people ignore her, and they don't talk to her. And, I mean... It's aggravating. Hmm. However, Taylor is a known villain, and, like, the three things she's known for are robbing a bank, (laughs) attacking the protectorate, and uh, teaming up with another, a bunch of other buildings for the Empire, not the, the... The AVB? Yes. One of the other bad boys in the city. Uh, and of course, the healer that has come to heal <laughs> is, is, is Panacea, is Amy. And they have a... I mean... <sighs> Amy is pretty mean here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I get why, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that Taylor has a really good line in here because Amy says, oh, if you're scared of me using my ability on you, that means you're a bad person because it's sort of equivalent. The, more, the worse of a person you are, the more you'll think about it and the more you'll be scared I'll do something worse to you. Uh. And Taylor's reply to that is, I envy you that it's so easy for you to think of things in terms of black and white. I'd like to think I'm a good person, believe it or not. Everything I've done, I did because I thought it was right at the time. In hindsight, some of the ends didn't justify the means, and sometimes there were unforeseen circumstances, like Dinah. But I don't think of myself as a bad person. Isn't that just a a nice little summary of Taylor's, (laughs) Taylor's mindset? Yeah. I also, I find it kind of funny how, like, Panacea puts herself on the moral high ground there, and it's just, like, it definitely feels like a little bit of that Dr. God complex. Like, oh, yeah, I, you, you'll, you're the one that will be paranoid about what I do to you, even though you've literally threatened on more than one occasion to completely ruin someone. To be fair. Lisa almost did ruin Amy's life in some fashion. So she's a little bit of a a grudge. (laughs) Also fair. But... And, I mean, Taylor was there and participatory in that, in, like, a, ooh, tell me more. (laughs) In all honesty, I don't think anyone in this situation is actually a good person. Oh, no. (laughs) But... I I do like that 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 little clash of wills there was nice. And it gives you a look into Taylor's mindset. There was another conversation that Taylor had with a nurse. Uh, the nurse offered her to use her phone, and then it was like thinking about it. it was like, oh no, I lo- I'm gonna offer a villain to use my phone. I can't do it right now. But Taylor declines it because uh, she's a good person, and she told her the nurse that, hey, that empathy with that empathy, you're gonna be a great nurse. Or get empathy fatigue and be a really bad nurse, but uh. Not as good of a a writer brand over there. (laughs) I'm rooting for that nurse, though. She did have, she did have compassion. Like, Uh, even if you're a shit person, you're in a shit situation, and I'm gonna help help you out. But Taylor does get healed by Panacea, uh, so she doesn't have a broken back. Uh, And she gets, she manages to get up and walk around and catches a glimpse of Shadowstalker, unmasked, and gasp, it's Sophia. Mm, I want to stab things. <laughs> oh, let me stab my desk and again. <laughs> we, we hear the audible flushing noise of Taylor's idea of maybe joining the wards just going away. It's gone. It's, it died. Uh, it, it didn't have a lovely funeral. It was killed uh, brutally in the aftermath With a crossbow. of the attack. <laughs> And we should put it on the memorial. <laughs> yes. Taylor's hopes and dreams. 
uh, to the best ward you would have had. <laughs> but I mean, some of the reason when we had this conversation originally about her joining the wards and I kind of snickered a little is because this. She's, oh, she'd have such a good life in the wards. <laughs> yeah. I also have a feeling that a lot of the wards from the, and the mostly the interlude we got from them are kind of good, like morally good for teenagers. <laughs> teenagers. I, I think that as soon, I think that if Taylor had joined the wards and then immediately if that Sophia had been revealed and Taylor was like, fuck no, they would have been like, huh, why? And if Taylor had told them, they would have been like, what the fuck, Sophia? What the fuck? It would have been a very different story. Yeah. Um, but because, uh, a villain has just found out a hero's identity. Uh, Taylor is given sort of three options of what she can do. Uh, go to jail. Uh, join the wards on a provisionary basis. Or the third option, which is usually reversed for capes they trust, is to give something equal in return, presumably her own identity. Which over to, so- over to Sophia in return. And like, hell no, is that ever going to happen? <laughs> yeah, no. I'm with Taylor on this one. No, I'd rather hell freezes jail. over. <laughs> uh, and Taylor feels like she's being backed into a corner. I mean, she, Legend and Arms Master and Miss Militia are there. And she feels like she has no options here. And then the Undersiders appear. <laughs> All alive. Lisa, coming in clutch. And <laughs> Lisa and all of them, they all have this really great dialogue where they make use of the fact that this is in the aftermath of an Embringer attack. And that there's this huge truce, like a treatise of some kind, with between heroes and villains, between all capes, about how things should work in an Embringer attack. And the the undersiders leverage that to a very brilliant degree uh, to to get out of this one because Miss Militia summons a gun and like they're about to drag the the undersiders out of there and Gru says you can start a fight here Gru spoke you better pray to some you start a fight here Gru spoke you better pray to some higher power that you can fucking spin this well enough with all those others looking. Because it's the end to the truth if you truce if you don't. Too many eyes on this. Gru turned his head and I leaned forward a little to see what he was looking at. There were capes in the far end of the hallway, staring at the scene, kept out of the main triag area by a set of PRT officers. Trickster leaned against a wall with a cell phone raised, recording a video. <laughs> and, Trickster! And then they, they still try to force the undersiders away. So Lisa gets access to like the intercom system. <laughs> Starts making a broadcast for all of those who don't have a front row seat. The very well armed Miss Militia is currently doing her best to point a burrito 92 FS at my head. If this broadcast ends prematurely, you can all rest assured that the protector is willing to kill and break the truce, and it means covering its dark, dirty little secrets. <laughs> Lisa was just like, Good, like most of my quotes this chapter was from Lisa. <laughs> it's like, sure, let's turn things around. You gave Skitter your three options. Here are my three. Number one, shoot us now and confirm to everyone in this room, civilian and cape alike, hero and villain, that you've got something to hide. It doesn't even have to be lethal. People will still have their concerns if you knock us out rather than let us talk. Two, I do my little announcement and the true sense. I really don't want to do that. I recognize how necessary it is. But if you decide that one cape's identity maybe getting publicity publicly revealed is worth the truce, well, that's on you, not me. And the third option is, of course, releasing Taylor to them. All, all the problems can go away. <laughs> and at first, like, Arms Master tries to stop it, so she kind of turns the conversation on, on him again. Uh, I'm implying that you set things up to guarantee yourself one-on-one fight with Leviathan. Who cares, after all, if some villains get murdered in the process, if it means stopping an Endbringer? <laughs> because he was like, you're bluffing. We, we've got nothing to hide. And she's like, oh, don't you? Okay. Well, 
hate to let you know, but I know everything you're trying to hide. Armsmaster has a fancy little computer system in his suit, set it up to predict Leviathan's movements and actions. Clockblocker tagged the Endbringer, put him on pause long enough for Armsmaster to set up the playing field the way he wanted it with that predictive program. Leviathan's going after the people who can make force fields, and Armsmaster uses this dangles Kaiser-like bait, puts more villains, Femya and Menya, in the way to Kaiser. Sure enough, Leviathan marks Kaiser as a target, charges him to the conveniently arranged villains, and goes straight to the spot where Skitter is. To your credit, if any credit is due, that was an accident. Your program can't account for that many variables, probably, in the chaos of a bunch of capes trying to keep Leviathan pinned down. Either way, Leviathan did as you wanted, followed the path you plotted, used a directed AMP blast to make to nuke Skitter's armband, ensuring she couldn't report Leviathan's position and call in reinforcements, buying you time to take on Leviathan one-on-one. -on -one. Who cares if she dies after all? She's a villain, and you're positive you'll win, and that'll it'll be worth the body count you just allowed Leviathan to rack up except you lost. And then she threatens to do another announcement. Tell everyone that's still wearing an armband an abbreviated version of the same story I just told you. How do you think they'd react? If you're really innocent, I'm sure your name would be cleared eventually after the test results came back from the armband. If it's wrong, we get in everyone's bad books for fucking around with that end the situation. Hell, I'll even submit to being detained while you guys get things checked out. You can take me from there to jail if I'm wrong. Either way, you get some jerk in custody. And Armsmaster tries to, like, tackle uh, Lisa, and Legend shoots him, and Leviathan holds a gun to his head. <laughs> the Not line. Leviathan. He's militia. I'm a little spacey, okay? So that's okay, the funny okay. image, is Leviathan with a gun in the background. <laughs> I'm imagining, like, a taller, like, kind of hunched but pale sl Slenderman with a tail. So, like, with a gun, I'm just imagining, like, a pointy hand and, like... You have to, like, two hands on one weapon, and you get a little point. But like. Arms Master is uh, taken into custody, and, but before he does, he drops the bomb. Oh, he drops the bomb. And the underside is that Taylor was going to betray them, but not really, but was going to betray them, and had been... She was absolutely to going to betray them. She just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it ends on Taylor wanting to run away, and we do a hard cut to the next chapter with her walking around a destroyed Brockton Bay, seeing the monuments. Uh, which, I mean, we're gonna go through the names, because there are quite a few of them died, but uh, there are a couple ones that are more important than others, so we'll just go through the ones that I recognized. Uh, we have Fenya, uh, Fenya, Menya, Fenya died, which we saw in the story. Uh, Galliant died. I believe we'd heard of Harold before, so he died. Uh, Iron Falcon died. Taylor had a whole paragraph about Iron Falcon. Seems important. Yep. Uh, Kaiser died. <laughs> Shielder died. Yes. And Velocity, the speedster uh, from uh, the Protectorate, died. And I believe those were the names from like the local capes that we recognized. Oh, wait. Velocity is the one that she hit in the junk, right? Oh, probably. He's, he's yeah. dead now. <laughs> Aw, that makes me sad. Uh, but Lisa comes to meet her, and they have a conversation, and Lisa reveals that, yeah, I, I knew the whole time. I knew you were going to betray us, but I also was fairly confident in my own abilities to sway you <laughs> because you didn't think you're planter at all. But we knew! She knew! Which I'm giving us kudos for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and she sort of talks with Taylor. Uh, Taylor doesn't know what she wants to do next, but Lisa kind of pegs it as, you actually want to rejoin the team. You know you do. <laughs> That's why you don't, don't know if you want to be a hero or not, or don't want to do this or that. You want to join the team again. Yeah. I think Taylor just doesn't want to be alone, and I think she thinks the undersiders are still her best bet. Yeah, and... Uh, Lisa gives a, a sentence of, like, some stuff uh, that if Taylor were to rejoin the, uh, the Undersiders, uh, I mean, even if they took you back, you'd have to eat crow, except a few concessions, like Coyle's pet. There'd be no more playing around. You'd have to go all in from here on out if you expected to convince them you were legit. And Taylor gears start turning in her head, something clicks, 
She forms a plan. Lisa catches on, asks her what the plan is and if it involves the undersiders, but the chapter ends before we get her answer. I really feel like I should know what, because he's good at foreshadowing. I feel like I should know what she's alluding to, but I have genuinely no idea what Gonna you come no next. idea what what plan she's just developed in her head. What what evil genius Taylor is is planning on doing? I suspect she's gonna be like, okay, well, I I was an inside man before. Now I'm gonna be an even more inside man, like an more insider, insidey man, super inside man. But I, other than that, I don't know. I do think I do think she is going to work towards a little bit more morality because she definitely saw how much she slipped. I mean, I'm not going to elaborate on anything involving this. We'll yeah, I don't want you to. Eventually. Uh, interlude 8 for this arc at the end of the arc is from Coil. Uh, this is an audio medium, so you can't see the double birds that Cass just gave to the microphone, but uh, they existed and they happened. Uh, so, uh, we, we gotta look into Coyle's cold, merciless perspective on how he looks at people. Uh, everyone had a hook, a vice, or something they needed on a primal, desperate level. Sometimes that need needed to be created or nurtured so it could later be hand-fed. Those people who were driven by such things carried that craving for something especially close to the surface, were among Coyle's favorite people, coming in a very close second to people who were useful. Those who are both useful and desperate for something Coyle could provide? Well, and he uh, grew apparently one of those types of people. The travelers are those type of people. It kind of gives a look into his, his underling base. Uh, we get a look into why the travelers are helping Coyle in this chapter. Uh, because of a woman named Noelle, who seems to have some sort of uh, power, and it seems to be getting worse and more destructive and more dangerous, and they're trying to fix it, and Noelle apparently blames Trickster, who we get the name Kraus from her. Don't know if that's the first or last name. Uh, Sounds like a last name. Yeah. It was shouted virulently, so probably a last name. Uh... <laughs> And we also get that during the Endbringer attack, it seemed like Leviathan was marching straight toward where Noel was. <laughs> and the travelers caught on to it and messaged him worried. And Coyle was worried, because <laughs> that's his base. Uh, so I guess we know where Coyle was during the Leviathan attack. Now. Uh, and the uh, Noelle has been trapped, kept isolated alone because her powers, uh, whatever is wrong with her, it makes her very dangerous uh, to the people around her. We can see as the building sh kind of shakes when she yells. And everyone turns their guns on her and all the Quill's men are like, <laughs> oh no. I would have been like, okay, I'm fucking bringing it down. Don't do that shit to me. Uh, but clearly something is wrong with her, and uh, Coyle is looking into it, but there is a very, very small chance of success in that matter, as uh, we get from Diana later. There's like a seven point something chance of success, which has gone down by 10%, so he wonders if someone died or left the city in the Endbringer attack that would have been useful uh, to solving his problem here. Uh, Good luck figuring that out. Who specifically of the thousands of, that died or evacuated. <laughs> but uh, he sort of brushes that aside. His plan without use of his power at this point of taking over the city is at a 77% success rate. With his power, he can boost that. So he's pretty confident. He's practically drinking in the victory celebration. And as he talks about his power, we get this interesting little paragraph within it that I thought I'd share. It had certainly been an expensive talent. Even with his ability to game the markets in a way that clairvoyance and precognitives couldn't detect, it had taken him years to pay it off. A maddening, 
frustrating endeavor when he had already been thinking of plans he wanted to set in motion, having to postpone them. And he still owed a favor, even now, up to a week's services. He couldn't be sure if he was powerful and secure enough to fight back, if they demanded too expensive a price or too much of his time at a point critical to his plan. Huh. That's a little weird. Deals and favors. Yeah, but it, it looks, it sounds like uh, Quill might have bought his power. Which is weird. It's an expensive mm. power. Mm-hmm. That's that's a little, that's expensive. That's a little mm. weird. That's a little strange. That's yeah. little and he owes someone a favor, a week's services, a week of working for someone. Or yeah, it's someone. not like we've gotten anything alluding to people manufacturing abilities or what? anything like that. No, what? we haven't, absolutely. Yeah. What are the case of DCs again? We don't talk about them. Uh, Foreshadowing? Who's she? Never heard of her. Uh, but the chapter ends on Coil killing Mr. Pitters. <laughs> Bitters weirds me out, Coil. Okay. He's not he's gone. Don't worry. Yeah. For now, even with the safeguards of his other realities, he would do nothing he couldn't explain away if he had to. He wouldn't entertain himself with anybody he couldn't replace. Mr. Pitter, replaceable. So he's dead. Poor Mr. Pitter. <laughs> I don't know if I feel super bad no. for the people that work for Coil. <laughs> and and it, it didn't allude to straight up Mr. Pitters being the one that actually gives Diana the drugs. Yes. Yeah. So actually, I take it back. Not poor Mr. Pitters. Child uh, crimes against children immediately puts you on my shit list. Yeah. So. Yeah, and Mr. Pitters, didn't you do this whole thing because your wife accused you of horrid crimes against children? Maybe like. Don't do horrid crimes against children right after having your wife killed. Yeah, Mr. Pitters, not looking great for you. Uh, Well, you're dead now, so. It doesn't fucking matter. But that was Arc 8 of Worm Extermination. What did you think about that, Cassie? My soul hurts for Taylor. Yeah. I got live texts from you while you were reading it, and they gave me such <laughs> do you, great... Do we want to read out some of those? Great joy. Most of them are just you, like, reading things that happen in the book. Okay, so... Ah! All the experienced heroes are going down. Ah! <laughs> Dunking, broken, back, and chained. What is this bullshot? Not bullshit. Bullshot. <laughs> Sophia! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> Times a thousand. Dunking Arms Master <laughs> was the next one. And then, I'm confused. I don't understand. What plan is she leading to? I feel like it should be obvious. Yeah. Um, for anyone wondering, uh, yes, that is actually how I text my friends the vast majority of the time. This one just had more exclamation points, and a couple misspelled words. Uh, yeah, so let's go over our usual things. Let's go over our opinions of the Undersiders. Uh, first up on the chopping block, Taylor. I'm be. I'm so sorry. Everything's going to shit for you. Do you need a hug? I'll give you a hug. I'm not a hug person, but I'd give you a hug. Oh. Literally, her backup plan got ruined by just the presence of Sophia, which I understand. She probably has a lot of trauma. She, not probably, she has a lot of trauma tied to Sophia and that whole group of girls. So I absolutely understand. And I can't even imagine. Cough, cough. This is a targeted political statement. Um, Feeling so betrayed by an organization that was put in place to, like, protect you and having such a horrible, horrible person being a member of that organization that people look up to. Cough. Cough, 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 cough. Uh, in any case, uh, just it's feel bad for Taylor uh, in this arc. Uh, next character, I don't think much has changed with him, but Gru slash Brian. Nah. Not liking him. No. <laughs> you can't. 
You can't. I. You can't be pissy with someone because they make a moral decision that's not actually hurting you. They're villains. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Really, they're super villains. Cassidy, if these I, people are super villains. <laughs> if I if I was a super villain, imagine that. Haha. I was a super villain. And I was calling for the extinction of all gerbils. All of them need to die. I don't like gerbils. You can't get, I can't get pissy at my fellow supervillains for being like, hey, um, actually, but like, they, okay, so like, I know we've been running with each other for a while and you don't like gerbils, but can I have this hamster? Like, the hamster's not my goal. The gerbils are my goal. Stop being angry about the hamster. You should be angry about the gerbils. Uh, I think you're sort of missing the point. <laughs> They're villains. And for one, Brian has the strongest motivation to work with Coil. He also has the strongest motivation to protect children. He is trying Does to care he? for his child. He has sister. never shown he has cared for any child other than Ayusha. Yeah, but... Mm. You're trying to apply hero logic to an actual supervillain. Then I'm gonna stick with my original answer. Ugh. <laughs> uh, Alec? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like your answers have gotten much uh, less positive than the last time we talked about these characters. I mean, Alec is just an apathetic douche. Like, I don't... Yeah, nothing's changed there. Nothing, yeah. He's, Except he has some sort get... of secret weapon that we don't know about. Oh, which is horrifying. So, and the, the sociopath tossed in there, just like, oh, oh, nice. The sociopath Fantastic. and the secret weapon. Okay. <laughs> Sociopath with powers over people in the. Mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Anyway, uh, Rachel. My heart hurts for her too. She also has a lot of rage, which I also like in characters. <laughs> I like the angry, broken ones. Do you, do you identify with Rachel on some level? <laughs> I think the fact that I had to think about it answers that question. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna say I'm not that similar to Rachel. No, you're not. But I feel for her. She's in a very, like the, the things that her power has just done to her brain has put her in a very complicated situation. Yeah, we talked about the whole representation of neurodivergent individuals. So I definitely feel for Rachel. Lisa? Girl. She is the best, most toxic best friend. <laughs> so you know the toxic best friend stereotype? Oh, yeah. But she's number one. She's, yeah, she's not only, like, good at being a good-ish, good, like, best friend, she's really good at being a toxic person. <laughs> I mean, I really like Lisa. That's no secret. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like her. I shouldn't, because she's, like, like all these people as characters. I don't think I'd like most of them as people <laughs> if I met them on the street. <laughs> but I, I like a lot of them as characters. I also feel like we're more inclined to like Lisa because we've been, she's shown us what she thinks a little bit more and also she, like literally shown that she's like, well, I kind of understand. Yeah, that's true. Is she the first undersider we've gotten a point of view from? Uh, because the only one, I don't think we've gotten one from Brian. We've definitely not gotten one from Alec. Uh, and Rachel's the one closest to her. We got one from a dog. Word Rachel, which definitely earned some sympathy points, but it wasn't from Rachel. I know. So, yeah, I think she was. So we definitely got that. And she's the most vocal. And she was kind of the most chill when Taylor was like, hey, whoa, hard line in the sand. She was 
like, or I think I said the wrong name. When Taylor was like, no, hard, hard line in the sand. We're not going to veer into kidnapping and dragging kids. Um, Lisa was kind of like, well, okay, that makes sense. I don't agree with you, but I respect your decision. And we like definitely saw that she was like, she recognized like, no, Taylor just has morals. She doesn't hate us. So I think that's why we're more inclined. Yeah, she has a whole big paragraph in Lisa does in her interlude about Taylor and how she couldn't imagine making the same decision that Taylor did, considering that Taylor seems, like, closer to the other other outsiders than she is. Uh, And she still chooses to to leave, so she sort of respects that Taylor made a hard decision there, even if she doesn't completely understand it. Yeah, which, and I definitely, and Lisa also, like I said, she's a good toxic best friend. She reached out to Taylor and was like, are you, like, actually doing okay? And Taylor was like, you know, I'm just in a shelter. And she was like, that's not what I asked. I asked if you're doing okay. <laughs> I didn't ask for your location. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm I'm in a shelter. Cool. Are you okay? Eh. Yeah. Uh, well, that concludes arc eight. Uh, it ended on quite the cliffhanger. Uh, and, I don't know, it just has one of my... Uh, a fun thing, I think. Uh, I can see them. There was a comment on that I wanted to read on the, the pages from old comments, but oh well, I can't find it. But it was just like, man, I'm really excited for next arc. How could you leave us on this cliffhanger? We're going to have to wait like a full week. And Wild Bo comes back. How could I? Yes. A full week. Yes. <laughs> And then takes a nice two-week break, like Matt. No, 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 because Arc 9, uh, which we're going to pick back up with next episode, Sentinels, is the Ward's interlude arc. <laughs> yeah, sure, just a week. <laughs> so definitely pulled a Matthew Mercer. Oh, yeah, we'll be back next week with a one-shot. Like, no, we don't want a one-shot. Yeah, so we'll pick back up with Arc 9 Sentinels next week. Uh, until then, we've been Agdol Adventures Reaser, and I'm Ashley. I'm Cassidy. Stay jazzy, jazz cats. And we will see you all next time. Bye.